As you take your seat, please do uh, open your Bibles again to uh, that passage we, we just read from 1 Thessalonians 2. We're going to look at verse 1 to 16 there. And uh, let me just thank you all again for your very warm welcome already uh, yesterday. And uh, yeah, we've had a really good time so far. And it's a pleasure to be here again and bring God's word um, to us all. And um, I've been asked to continue in the series you just started last week. As Carl started with the sermon on 1 Thessalonians 1, I've been asked now to continue 1 Thessalonians 2. And just thinking about reading a letter like this in your Bible, have you, have you ever thought of this? How special it is that we get to read a letter that was sent by one of the apostles to a young church so many years ago. And, and rather than thinking of this as, well, we we're sort of sneaking in and eavesdropping and maybe you find your letter of your parents that they wrote to each other ages ago and you think, oh, am I supposed to read this? Is Paul's rem reminding them of all that they had been through together? But, but this is also for us. It wasn't written to us in the first place, but God has put it in our Bibles for us to learn from, to, to grow by, as, as a young church here, to be encouraged by. So we're going to continue then reading this letter so long ago to the Thessalonians and, and learn what God wants us um, to teach us, to correct us, to encourage us. Now, let me just start with a short note about the structure of this letter, because that will be really helpful as we look at the passage in a moment. Think of it when you send an email or a letter to someone. There's, there's a typical way in which we start and end, isn't it? And that was very much the case also for the letters that we have in the Bible. They start this person writing to this person, and then something about grace, praise, thanksgiving, and at the end, some greetings, etc. And usually that is a very short opening, a few words of prayer and thanksgiving. But actually, here in Thessalonians, that section continues all the way to the end of chapter 3. And it is quite striking that Paul sort of keeps interrupting himself as he prays and, and thanks for these people. Suddenly he, he goes back to retelling the story. Do you remember how we met? Do you know the time that we spent together? And, and then he picks up the prayer again. For example, you see that in chapter 2 and verse 13. Just that little verse. And we also thank God continually because... And actually, only in verse 13, he's actually doing that. And in verse 14, he, he shifts back into the, the story again. And then only at the end of chapter 3 does he finish this section. So it is, it is good to see that because chapter 2, the passage we're looking at this morning, is really a, a retelling by Paul of what they had been through together. He is saying again and again, maybe you saw it when Paul read that, you know, as you know. You remember, you are witnesses. Paul is, is calling to mind what they had been through together. Now, now, why would that be? And of course, he doesn't say it explicitly, but we can imagine the story, right? Maybe you remember if you were here last week, uh, as Carl, Carl was sharing about the situation of that city there in the Roman Empire, and how these people had come to see Jesus now as Lord. They were no longer saying, Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. And that made them from maybe appreciated citizens into the scum of the city. And they were, they were rejected. And there was hardship now for them. It was difficult to be a Christian in those days. Because they were surrounded by all these pagan idols. And they were called, even for their work maybe, to, to bring sacrifices to idols. And now they said, no, I can't do that any longer. I want to serve Jesus. And it, it put them uh, at odds with the rest of society. And Paul now, he says, remember how we came. Remember how it all started. This is worth it. Keep going. And, and whatever other people might be saying about me or about this message, remember how it all started. If you think back of, of last year and um, the turbulent political situation here in the UK, well, Every time a new prime minister is chosen, you see it again, like the smear campaign starting, people trying to discredit someone, digging up things from their past, and they do that to undermine their views and their message. So you can imagine, what better way for people there in Thessalonica to, to hinder these young Christians and to undermine their faith than by saying, hey, that guy Paul, 
actually, he is just trying to trick you. That guy, Paul, he's, he's just a, a weak man. Why, why are you even following him? That they are undermining Paul in order to undermine the message. And Paul is therefore recalling them. Do you remember? Do you remember how we worked among you? Do you see how that bring, gives you uh, yeah, trust for the message? Because we were having a trustworthy gospel ministry. So as, as Chris already said, that's, that's the theme really for my sermon. Let me, yeah. Okay. Trustworthy gospel ministry. That's what we're thinking about this morning together. And trustworthy gospel ministry, really, if you only remember one thing of this morning, it, trustworthy gospel ministry requires a consistent character and, and a sharing of the whole of life and not just a message. So that's, that's what it's all about. It's a sharing of whole of life and that walk the talk, like preach what you, what you practice or practice what you preach. And of course, providentially, it's um, yeah, quite amazing how God brings these things together. Because now you, as a, as a young church, seeking a pastor, and I get to preach on this passage. Preaching about what go- trustworthy gospel ministry is like. And of course, that's very challenging. When, when I get to tell you, this is the kind of pastor you should be looking for, I'm, I'm very aware that you are looking at me and, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that being said... This is, this is a challenging passage, and, and not just for pastors or, or elders or leaders here. This is for all Christians, because all of us are called to take part in that task of sharing the good message, right? Um, Carl and, and Andrew were speaking about that. We, we're seeking here in this part of, of Newark, you're seeking to be a witness and to, to sp- spread this good message. So in that sense, we're all involved in this gospel ministry. Now, the first thing then to look at. First thing is, a trustworthy gospel ministry relies on God, even when it gets hard. Let's read again verse 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Paul writes, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Now, as I said last week, Carl started this series by, by describing something from the background there in Thessalonica, also from Acts chapter 17. These people had become uh, persecuted because they now did not lo- no longer want to worship idols or serve the Roman emperor. No, they, they wanted to serve Jesus, follow him. And here then, Paul writes in, in chapter two, 1, just to look back, how they, their response to that message, how it had been so powerful. Because their faith and their joy in, in the midst of that opposition and that suffering, it was so powerful that the message had spread all over the region. And let's read again verse 9 of chapter 1. Halfway the verse, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven. And as Carl said, th- those are the big themes in this letter. Turning to God, away from the idols, to serve God. And also waiting for his son from heaven. It's the waiting for Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath, as verse 10 says. And let me then just call, if you're not a Christian yet this morning, that is why this, we're speaking about opposition and suffering. And you might wonder, why is that worth it? But it is because we follow a saviour, Jesus, who saves us from the coming wrath. That we all deserve because of our sins, our, our rebellion against God. We don't live as our maker wants. And he has given us a saviour to be right again with him. And that's why even going through this suffering, choosing to, to follow Jesus is so worth it. Now Paul, there in verse 1 and 2 then of chapter 2, he says... Remember how we came to you. We faced the very same thing. I didn't call you to a life that I was uh, sort of felt too good to do for myself. Uh, Think of it like some of, maybe you're in a a big company working and your manager is, you feel sometimes as if he's so far removed from your ordinary day-to-day work. I think you just don't get whatsoever. You can be calling me to work in this way, but it just doesn't work. 
Well, Paul says, I, I know exactly what you go through in day-to-day -day life. I face persecution in every place where I come. Even the, the very place where we were before we came to you, in Philippi, we were persecuted ourselves. So Paul wasn't calling them to a life which he didn't want for himself. But there in verse 2 he says, with the help of God, we dared to tell you this, his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Because Paul's also clear, he couldn't do that in his own strength. He relied on God's help. And, and therefore, dear Christians, that hasn't changed. We here in the UK, we might be living in a very unusual time and place, actually, where we are not severely persecuted. We can sit here in freedom this morning without fear of, of, of people attacking this building, bombing us, or, or in the meantime, destroying our houses. But as, as Chris already prayed for, we should remember so many millions of Christians around the world for whom that is a very real possibility. Think of, uh, of all the people who, who really um, face being robbed of their houses or of food help or who can't get a place in hospital because they are Christians or those who, whose crops are, are burned or, or stolen or their freedom is taken away in prison. It's so real. And maybe you saw it just this last week. Open Doors has again released a new world watch list. So summarizing the, the state of persecution around the world. I want to recommend that to you. Read those stories. Be encouraged by it, by their, by their courage and, and their ongoing worshipping of Jesus. But also pray for them. They need our prayers. But closer to home, can you say what Paul said there in verse 2? He said, I dare to tell you the gospel. Well, can you say, I dare to tell the gospel to my friend or my family member in the face of strong opposition? Wow, that's tough, isn't it? That's not easy. But note how he starts that sentence. With the help of God, we dare to tell you. And that God is still your help today. That is why we can witness to the people around us. God helps us today. So, first of all then, trustworthy gospel ministry is that we rely on God, on his help in the face of opposition. And we can also rely on God's power and God's word. And I want to highlight that from the final verses of, of the passage we've been reading. So, if you look down to verse 13, let's read that one again. Paul writes, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Now Paul, Paul just wants to thank God. He says, this work, this message that I brought, it's, it wasn't just my words, but it is God's word. And, and I see it because it is at work in you. It is working. It's a very powerful word. And, and that is the word that still goes out today. God uses it to, to break open hard hearts and, and to open blind eyes. He gives the Holy Spirit to take these words and bring conviction of sin and, and turning to God and repentance and faith and joy and hope. And that still goes on today. And that is the, the encouragement we have to go out with this word, knowing that it is God's word and with God's power it will bring this, this work, this fruit, uh, as he says, it is at work in you who believe. Those people received it and, and Paul was so thankful to God for that. But, but that word being at work in them who believe, how was that visible? Well, look at verse 14. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews. Well, if you just glance back over to the other side of the page, chapter 1 and verse 6, notice the similarity. Chapter 1, verse 6, Paul wrote, You became imitators, same as in 2 verse 14, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Do you see the pattern? You became imitators of Jesus, and then of Paul and Silas, Jesus' messages, and really in that also 
imitators of all the other churches who had, had gone through the same thing. When, when our Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, he was rejected. He suffered before he received his glory. And so also did the first Jews who received the gospel. They were persecuted, first of all, by Paul himself. But when Paul saw the Lord Jesus and when he came to faith, he also had this joy and, and this desire to then spread the news about Jesus. And that's how it came to the Thessalonians. The best news ever that at the same time really rocked their lives. Changed them from, from being appreciated citizens to being the scum of the city. But in that they became imitators of the Lord and of Paul and Silas and of the churches in Judea. Because, because their own people now oppose them and, and hate them and make them suffer. Now, just a quick note then on verses 15 and 16. Maybe you noticed that. But he says that they suffer the same things from, from the Jews there in Judea. And then in verse 15 and 16, he, he, he continues to sort of say a few more things about that situation. And about those Jews. But we mustn't see that as some sort of a, a, an anti-Semitic rant. And Paul just having a go at the Jews there. That's not the point. But it is about what, what verse 14 says. You Thessalonians... You are suffering just as the churches in Judea are suffering from the Jews. So see what, what that leads to. See what the consequence is. There in verse 15. They displease God. They are hostile to everyone. And in this, verse 16. In this they heap up their sins to the limits. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Do you see how terrible it is when people oppose good Christ? When they oppose the messages of Jesus? And what a contrast it then is with those who are basically their victims, those who do receive Jesus. Because look back to chapter 1 verse 10. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. That's the big contrast. You either face God's wrath or you are rescued from it. And that's all determined by your response to Jesus. Still today, do you oppose him or do you receive him as your saviour and lord? Do you, do you ignore him only to eventually stand before him as a judge? Or are you waiting for him, for him to come back as the Thessalonians did? Now back to verse 13 then. Paul wrote, when you received the word of God... You accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at, indeed at work in you who believe. So that's then the, the second thing we see about a trustworthy gospel ministry. Paul brings them not human words, but the word of God himself. And word of God, we often use that to, to describe the Bible, but here it, it means much more than that. It means Paul's preaching, which was based on the Bible. And that's just the case for us today. It wasn't just for him because he was an apostle. But when you share the gospel with your friend in a way that matches with the Bible, is faithful to the Bible, it is the word of God that comes to your friend or your family member. And now, as, as at this very moment, when I get to preach from the Bible, insofar as I'm faithful to the Bible, it is God's word that is coming to us. And that is why it is so important that Preaching has a, has a central place in the times we come together. And that the Bible itself has, is the foundation for all that we do in the Christian life. Because of course the Bible itself is the only truly inspired, directly inspired and sufficient and inerrant word of God. So we have to t always go back to the Bible. Test everything by the Bible. But isn't that amazing? Doesn't, that, doesn't this give you encouragement to share the good news? That you know... When I speak it to them, this is the word of God, that powerful word of God, and it has the power to open their hearts. When God wants to do that, he will do it. But also, doesn't that give us an incredible responsibility to respond, to receive it, and to live accordingly? Now, that leads to another thing about gospel, trustworthy gospel ministry. First of all, it relies on, on God, on God's help. And on God's word and God's power. But now we can see also that 
trustworthy gospel ministry must be for the right motives, for God's praise. I want to show that to you from verse 3 to 7. So let's read those again. Verse 3. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, nor from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. You see the contrast. Paul is saying it was not in this way, but in that way. Not such, but such. And in this, he again calls upon them to remember the way he ministered. And, and to see that Paul acted with the right motives. And as I said, maybe, maybe he was defending himself against very personal attacks. Or he was making it very clear the contrast between him and false teachers that were going around. Much maybe like what you can find on, a, on an average Christian TV station nowadays. Where you find people, these so-called prosperity gospel teachers. Who, who are really, <laughs> contrary to what Paul writes, going for their own gain. And, and from greedy motives. Now, obviously, there's, there's way too much in this passage for me to, to unpack all. But let me just highlight a few things. As in, in verse 3, it says it's, it's not from error. He was bringing the truth. And there were no impure motives. But Paul preached with a clean conscience. And in verse 3, there, there was no cunning or, or trickery involved. Even though his ministry, there, there were miracles there. But he says that, there's, that wasn't... Just to trick you into something. There's no sort of hidden small print. And now ha, I got you to believe. But now you really see what you went into. No. He says in verse 4. We speak as those approved by God. To be entrusted with the gospel. In the end. In the end God sees all the motives. And he tests our hearts. In verse 5 he says it again. God is our witness. And Paul knows it. Whatever other people say about him. In the end, what God says about him, that's far more important. So do you and I share the gospel with that in mind? That God knows our hearts and our motives. And I'm not saying that as a sort of a way to, to scare you, saying, oh, well, he sees all my mixed motives. And of course, it should make us careful how we share. But, but as a Christian, you may see that as, as your heavenly father who knows with what motives you share. So whatever people in society then think about you, well, like calling you a bigot or outdated or whatever it is, scum of the city. No, God sees you and he knows your motives. He knows what's in your heart and if you share it out of love for those around you, God knows that. Even though sometimes people might not see it. And this approval from God to be entrusted with the gospel, as he says in verse 4. It continued from the apostles all the way down to today. Later on, he, Paul would write to Timothy, um, to Timothy 2, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who would then also be qualified to share with others. It is going on and it is spreading and more and more people are involved. And a few verses later, he said, call to Timothy, Do your best to present yourself as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Well, think of that. As a Christian, and you go out to share the gospel with someone, you are approved by God. You might see it then at your local sort of car sales place. Approved seller of this and this brand. Like by the big factories, they have been approved. They, yes, these guys are okay. They can sell our product. Well, as a Christian, you are approved by God himself. To be his ambassador. To share the good news about his son, the Lord Jesus. Now let's quickly go on into verse 4. Some other things that Paul says. He's not trying to please people. But God. Well, how often do we sort of blunt the edges of the message? Or are we tempted to hide the bad news about sin and God's wrath and hell? I mean, we only want to say, well, this, this is just giving you a good life. 
Let's not try and sort of please people, make it a comfortable message. But let's share it with the goal of pleasing God. Pleasing God, do you realize what that means? God has pleasure when we live for him. Isn't that far better than receiving praise from people or pleasure from approval from the people around us? And then in verse 5 he says, we never used flattery. And again, that's all about motive. Because in this letter he says a whole lot of positive things about the Thessalonians. He, call, he praises them basically for their life. It's a very positive letter for this young church. But it's all about motive. Because again and again he says, no, I thank God. I praise God for you. Paul wants that the praise goes to God. He doesn't praise these people in order to sort of get their approval. No, he genuinely is, uh, is aimed at God with his motives. And the final one then in verse 5, this was no cover-up for greed. Paul didn't get rich with his ministry. In verse 9, he, he describes that he made every effort not to appear that way. Because he says, we work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. He, had, he, had, he, he writes the same in Corinth. There again, he needed to distance his ministry so clearly from all those other charlatans and false teachers that were going around, trying to get rich by sharing some good news. And isn't that what we still see today? So many people just have a, a positive self-help style, um, just make sure, oh yes, you are good, you are good. You just believe uh, in positive things and it will all happen. And, oh yeah, by the way, donate to my ministry. No, that, that's not the way to go. Paul says it wasn't a cover-up for greed. Later on, he would call for all elders and leaders not to be lovers of money. That's in 1 Timothy 3. So, summarizing it really in verse 6, we were looking for praise. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you nor anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Verse 7, instead, we were like young children among you. Well, you might think that's, that's not a very sort of appealing picture, right? Presenting his ministry. Oh, we, we were like, like young children among you. What's that about? But that's the word picture. He says we were not sort of throwing our weight around as apostles. No, we were like a small child. In, in a sense, in a sense. Not, not trying to be like the big guy and, and praise me. No, it's a, we, we genuinely acted out of love for you. Seeking God's praise. So that's what trustworthy gospel ministry is like. Having the right motives. Showing that his character was in line with his message. That they, these people could trust Paul. And therefore, more importantly, they could trust the message he was bringing. Now, these verses are a really helpful checklist for us all then. As we seek to share the good news. And, and especially for those of us who are in, in a more sort of specific ministry role. First of all, of course, elders and pastors. But also maybe if you're a home group leader or you work in a Sunday school or in another setting where you get to teach. Do it for the right motives. Then it is a trustworthy ministry. Now, finally, a third element. That it means that a trustworthy gospel ministry is not just about... Sharing a message or as a friend of mine says, dropping a truth bomb and, and running away. No, you share life together. So let's read again verse 7, sort of halfway in to verse 12. Halfway verse 7, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. I think the, the verse here that summarizes it so well, and which is really almost the most challenging verse in this section, is verse 8. Don't you think? We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. 
trustworthy gospel ministry is, is all in. It's a whole of life calling. And Paul unpacks that really here with these family related pictures or metaphors. A mother, a father. And before you think this is just about pastors though, remember that the Bible uses this picture of a family for the whole church. The church is a family. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters and why Paul keeps doing that in this letter. So in that way, the Christian life is all about sharing together. And it doesn't mean we all move into one big house or one big community, but, but it does show something of the importance of spending time together, meeting with each other, helping, loving, serving each other, keeping each other, walking in the truth, following this message based on the Bible. You can't stay on your own as a Christian. You are saved to be part of the body of Christ, the church. So it's sharing not just the gospel, the message, but life. That's what Paul and Silas did. I realized they had hardly been with them. Maybe a few weeks or so before they had to flee for the persecution that came. And yet, he writes there, verse 7, he, as a nursing mother, they cared for them. They loved them. It can be very quick, isn't it? You just, you've hardly met another Christian. Maybe you're on holiday, gone to another church, and you just feel a bond straight away. And to be honest, it, it, it felt common here. Just you meet fellow, fellow Christians, and you feel at home, and you think, yes, we have something in, in common that goes so much deeper than, than a, some superficial hobby. It's amazing to, to see that happening in, in the church. But they should then share life together. In verse 10, Paul says, that means you also see someone else's character. The way they dealt with life, with the difficult things of life. Look at verse 10 again. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Those people would have noticed it when Paul's life and character did not match. Practice what, we, what you preach, we say nowadays, right? Otherwise, the message is so severely undermined. Think of politicians who don't obey the laws they set themselves. Didn't that bring Boris Johnson down last year? Or think of the police officers in the news who, who are, are bad criminals themselves. It's such a bad witness for the credibility of, of a politician or the police. But the same is true when Christians do that. Think of all the scandals with pastors who, who are involved maybe in adultery or abuse or theft. And what a terrible witness that is to the gospel. And that's of course the negative side. If, if character or life does not match with what you preach. But the same thing happens when it does align. And when it is positive. And when people walk into this building and they see a group of people who genuinely love the Lord Jesus. And their life shows it. That in itself is such a powerful witness. There was a pastor in Scotland some 150 years ago. Robert Murray McChain. Maybe you've heard of it. He famously said. My people's greatest need is my personal holiness. It's true. It's so challenging. I wonder. If, if, is this what you think about. When you think about. Well, what, what should be my pastor. What is his greatest need. Another pastor today, still alive, he is uh, Kevin de Jong. He applied this and he said, My congregation needs me to be humble before they need me to be smart. They need me to be honest more than they need me to be a dynamic leader. They need me to be teachable more than that they need me to teach at conferences. If your walk matches your talk, if your faith costs you something, if being a Christian is more than a cultural garb address they will listen to you that's what he wrote in in one of his books and it's so true isn't it and that's why paul in the requirements for elders and deacons keeps emphasizing it's about character more than gifting of course gifting is important as well but it's about character first and foremost and paul does that here writing to the thessalonians he says did you see me did you notice my own witness my own character he calls them quite boldly, boldly 
to be imitators of himself. Well, would you dare to do that? Imitate my life. What a high responsibility. Because isn't it true the longer you walk with Christ, the more you realize that you're a sinner. And that you need grace and forgiveness and God's strength every day. I am a sinner. I need that every day. But to be sure, before we think, well, Paul was some sort of super apostle. No, he knew this as well. He writes there, you know how holy and blameless and righteous I was. But he doesn't say sinless. He knew he was a sinner. He wrote it to the Romans. Maybe you know these verses. What a wretched man I am, he said. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He didn't just know that he was a sinner though. He knew the power of the Holy Spirit. Helping him to become a, a Christian better day after day following the Lord Jesus. Truly becoming more holy as time went on. So let me, let me draw it to a conclusion. This is our calling, brothers and sisters. To become imitators of our Lord. Imitators of Paul and Silas and the apostles. Imitators of those churches that have gone before us. In Judea and in Thessalonica. Becoming holy and righteous and blameless like them. Persevering all the way to the end as we wait for Jesus to come back. And what, what a day that will be. All sin, truly gone. Truly holy as he is holy. But till that day we need each other. While we all rely on the word and the help and the power of God. And that's why Paul wrote that he wasn't just like a caring mother among them but also like a father. There in verse 11. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Encouraging comforting urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory so shall we keep that in view God calls us into his kingdom and what a privilege that is and do you long for more and more people to know that so we and, and pastors and elders leaders first and foremost we are all called to a trustworthy gospel ministry relying on God even when we are opposed having the right motives and sharing not just a message, but our whole lives. And then that message is, is emphasized and it is proven by our walk. So let me urge you all then, and, and myself, to live lives worthy of God. And may that bring God all the praise and glory. Amen. Now if I'm correct, our closing hymn is, O Church, Arise. Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, yes, thank you. So let's stand and sing that together. Thank <laughs> you.